Hello and welcome to another instalment of Beards and Cars Rivals. And for those who are new to this series, basically what we do is take two or more vehicles and then pit them in a showdown to find out, especially for potential buyers, which one could or should be the better choice for you. And we've featured a number of these already, and the Jag XK or the XKR in a number of different forms has featured a number of times. Now, by far, the most common question that I get as an XKR owner myself is why did you buy the 4.2 instead of the 5 litre? Surely that's kind of an obvious choice to go for the faster car. Well, I actually addressed that in the first episode of this series. It's still the most successful episode so far as well, so be sure to check that one out if you're torn between the 4.2 and the 5. For now though, this one is focusing on what is easily the second most common question which I get asked, and that is, should I buy the base model XK, or should I pay a little bit more, or in some countries a lot more perhaps, depending on taxes and imports, for the R model. Is it actually worth the extra cash? Am I going to notice a difference? Which one is more practical? Which one's more useful for daily life? And those may, to some people, sound like strange questions to ask about a, you know, three, 400 horsepower GT car, but that's actually one of the beauties of the Jag XK, even more so than its equivalent 911s or Astons, and that is that, yes, you can 100% use it every day, it is practical enough, it is reliable enough, and even when something does break, it's no way near as expensive to get parts and to fix, or even to buy, as many of its rivals are. And so, for this particular instalment, we're focusing on the 4.2 variants, the XK 4.2 base model versus the XKR 4.2, which is the one that I own. For a future episode, we're gonna revisit this with XK versus R, but in the form of the five liter models. Now in that instalment, it's actually gonna swing the opposite way, which is kind of a spoiler alert, but we'll get to that one when I have footage of a five liter XK, because even though I've driven one, I didn't get the chance to get the footage. So I can't really feature it on the channel yet. So stick around for that one, of course. For now though, as I said, we're honing in on that 4.2. Now, first of all, of course, there are big differences in terms of the spec and the performance. That's the juicy stuff. So let's get into it first. Both of these have the 4.2 V8, both rear-wheel drive, of course, they both have the same seating layout, etc. In terms of the shape and the size, and even the weight of the car, there's not too much of a difference. Of course, if you add in the convertible as a factor, you could also consider my thoughts on these as including the open top as well. So if you are curious to buy a convertible, basically just apply everything I'm saying here, but imagine it without a roof, <laughs> because a lot of the rest just applies the same. Now, 4.2 V8, base model is naturally aspirated, the R is of course supercharged, and we're going to come back to that later on because some people may have, for instance, reliability or maintenance concerns. In terms of power, first of all, the base model has 300 horses, which always felt a little bit underpowered to me, but again, we'll revisit that in a second to actually talk about whether or not it feels that way. And then the R has 420 horsepower, or technically just under. So around a 120 horsepower difference between the two. That's pretty significant. The torque on the lower model is 303 pound feet, which is 411 Newton meters. And that compares about as well as you'd expect to the higher cars, 413 pound feet or 560 Newtons. So there's a pretty vast gulf in both power and torque between these two cars. The question of course is, does that translate to actual performance? Simple answer is yes. A full second separates these cars in terms of acceleration, and that might not sound like that much, but that is literally the difference, especially around 2006-2007, between hot hatch territory and super sports or GT car territory. Because the base model does 0-60 to in 5.9 officially, I'm sure you could get it a little bit quicker than that if you launched it perfectly, but that's the official, and we're going with the official versus official spec, 5.9 versus 4.9 on the R. So a pretty big difference between the two. In terms of top speed, they are technically both limited to 155. I'm not sure exactly what the top speeds are without those limiters because surprisingly not many people seem to have tried to have found out. Of course you can get like speed packs and stuff. I suspect if you were to just remove the limiters completely, I would expect the lower model to maybe do around 163, 165 given the 300 horsepower, and the higher model, probably 175, 
possibly 180, but probably closer to the 175. I mean, if you compare it to the Audi R8 of the time with the same amount of power, that could do about 185 miles an hour, so it's not outside the realm of possibility, but I suspect it's around the 175, being a little bit more conservative about it. Now, that is a significant difference on paper, but what do they actually feel like? Does one feel significantly faster? Well, I have to say, having driven, as I said, all four versions, and multiples of each in some cases, yes, you definitely can feel a difference. However, that's not to say that the base model feels slow. It does, however, definitely feel slower than the R model, which is exactly what you'd expect, of course. Now, the way which I would describe the difference in performance is actually very similar to the way which I would describe their look. And I think it's basically what you'd expect. The lower model has a more smooth, restrained, and I would describe it as maybe even a little bit more of an elegant approach to its performance. It's more of like a, a progressive way of delivering its speed where it doesn't necessarily feel like it only has 300 horsepower. And that's mostly due to the torque as well, helping out a lot. Because it is, at the end of the day, a fairly large car to only have 300 horsepower in, physically speaking. But the performance doesn't feel slow. It's not necessarily the most exciting thing around for acceleration, but it isn't slow by any stretch. With the other car, there's the faint, faint whine of the supercharger, because it was specifically engineered to be quieter, which I appreciate. And it's definitely more vicious with its acceleration. You can spin up the wheels more easily. Of course, it's significantly faster. And if you put them in a head-to-head -head race, I'm sure you would see a significant difference. And of course, the longer the race, the bigger the difference you're going to see. So is the R faster? Absolutely. If you're looking just for performance, then of course go for the R. But that brings us to the next stage of the discussion, which is the way they feel in terms of daily use. Because, of course, most of us aren't going to be doing 175 miles an hour or necessarily launching it off the line like it's a drag race every time you pass a McDonald's. So what do they feel like at normal speeds? What do they feel like as daily drivers, as, for instance, commuter cars even? I use mine as my daily driver. So what's it like from my experience in comparing that to the lower model? Well, this is where the lower model for some people may have an edge because, yes, it is A, cheaper to buy, and B, the fuel is slightly better as well. Now, in terms of stuff like tax and parts, you're not going to notice a massive difference between the two. Now, when it comes to something like fuel economy, the difference isn't as massive as you might expect, given the huge difference in power, torque, and performance, and that's partially because turbos and superchargers don't just make a car drink more fuel. They actually do technically make them more efficient, especially in the form of a turbo. They only use more fuel if you use more fuel, if that makes sense. If you put your foot down more, of course you're going to use more fuel, but sometimes you can actually have similar or even better economy out of a turbo car with more power than a car in the range without one. For instance, if you, as an example, compare the fuel economy on a Porsche Panamera V8S to the Panamera Turbo, the Turbo has 100 horsepower more, and it's about a second quicker to 60, the fuel economy is about the same because it's more efficient. In the case of these, there is a fractional difference, and according to the aggregated scores that most owners get averaged out, you're looking at about 25 to the gallon, that's UK gallons, which is different to American gallons, on the case of the lower model. So 25 on the lower, and about 23 on the R. Now that's fairly accurate to real life. Mine, according to my fuel receipts, which I checked because I was curious myself, actually averages more like 24 in the kind of daily driving that I do. You can drop down to like 15, 16 if you drive it like in London in bumper to bumper traffic. And if you get it out on the highway, you can comfortably get it to like 33 to 35 average, sometimes even higher. So the fuel economy for what it is, is very good. Something like an Aston V12 certainly can't match it. Mine would average, as I said, more like 24. And what that means in practice is that according to those aggregated scores, you can expect a tank range if you decide to fill up that 15 and a half gallons or 70 litres, just under 71 technically, about 390 miles, just under, on the lower model, and about 357, 360 on the R. 
So again, not a huge difference, only about 20 or 30 miles. Mine averages about 370 to the tank, so right between the two. So in practice, those are the kind of ranges you're gonna be looking at, and it will cost you about 70 or 80 pounds to fill that tank. So of course it's not gonna rival something like a Ford Fiesta on economy, but again, for a GT car, that's more than manageable enough for most owners to use, even on a daily basis, if you choose to. In terms of other aspects of practicality, honestly, there's not much in it. In terms of space, there is no significant difference. Now, another very common question which I get is, can a larger or taller or otherwise bigger driver comfortably use one of these in either coupe or convertible form regularly without having a bad back? The answer is simple and direct, 100% yes. I'm 6'3", I'm certainly not a small guy, I have more than enough space in the Jag. It might look like I'm very close to the ceiling, or to the roof, <laughs> but that's because the seat is exactly where I want it. I can actually put the seat even further back, recline it even more if I wanted to, and put it so far away from the pedals that I can barely touch them. I've said before, I believe on the channel, that I strongly feel that anyone up to like six foot seven, six foot eight even, could drive even the hard top version, let alone the open top. And of course, with the same shell, the same body, that applies to both cars identically. In terms of rear space, there is no difference whatsoever between the two. So in other words, unless you're Douglas Barder, you're gonna struggle to fit in the back. Most owners use it as luggage space. I've only taken people in the back once. In fact, twice, actually. Once I had my niece and her boyfriend in the back, and the other time I had one of my nephews in the front and one in the back. Both times it was a struggle, so unless they're very small children, you are going to struggle. But generally speaking, as I said, most owners will use it for storage first. Both of them are the hatchback version, unless you get the convertible. That's actually another reason why I prefer the hardtop, because the trunk space is technically a little bit better. But the fact that it's a hatch just kind of appeals to me. I like the shape that it gives it with the fastback style. It means that you can put quite a bit of stuff in the trunk and also put stuff through into the car if you want to as well, which again just adds to the usability on a daily basis. Now finally, in terms of issues and value for money, in terms of reliability, first of all, things which can break, things which you're gonna have to maintain or purchase or repair, there's actually not a huge difference between the two. The biggest differences are gonna be stuff like supercharger work, because one doesn't even have one, of course. However, from what I've read, experienced, seen, and heard, it doesn't really tend to be the supercharger that's gonna break. Of course it can, but it's not like adding that is making a significant knock to the car's life expectancy or reliability. These engines are capable of hundreds of thousands of miles if cared for correctly. Mine is now in the six-figure territory, and others I've known and heard have 200, 250, even more thousand miles, which is far more, of course, in kilometers, which again for a GT car is amazingly high. The one thing which I will warn about, and I actually touched on this in my best and worst things about owning an XKR video, which I would definitely recommend checking out if you haven't already, is that you will have, at a certain point, or certain points in your ownership experience, chances are certain gremlins which will come up with the car. Sometimes electrical, could be battery related. I see a number of those in the owner's forum, the owner's club, that kind of thing, and even in my own experience, where you'll have these smaller, more annoying things to deal with. Maybe a mirror won't fold in correctly, maybe a bulb will go a couple of times because of a bad connection, maybe you'll have a, a seemingly false warning on the dash. Those things can happen. The great thing is, though, you don't need a specialist. It's not a particularly complicated car, as far as this stuff goes, and the repairs are not that expensive. I've replaced certain parts on the car that weren't too crazy, even the work that needed to be done, and of course most of that is down to who you take the car to, if you have a, a reliable, good mechanic or a garage. So no, the maintenance is not crazy by any stretch, and that's a huge advantage, which it has over a number of other cars which I love, such as Maserati's, but again, I've talked about that in the Jag versus Maserati video, and in terms of reliability, the really, as far as I can tell, is nothing in it. Both of them are very capable engines, very capable cars, and whatever issue one can potentially have, they usually will both have, because they're that similar. Things which I would recommend looking out for if you're gonna test drive one is, for instance, false warnings on the dash, but that's fairly obvious. 
listen when you're driving with the windows closed and open for any squeaks coming from the corners of the car. That will usually be the suspension bushes that need changing. Feel for the ride, it may be seeming a little bit too harsh for what it is. Again, that can be similar to that issue. Feel or look for any judder in the steering wheel, especially under braking around 40 miles an hour or lower. That can be a warp disc or once again can be part of those suspension bush issues. Again, not particularly expensive or complicated things to replace though, which is the great thing about the car. Even when something does need changing, unless it's you know a full engine out rebuild, which let's be honest would be expensive on any car, even a low level hatchback, you don't really need to worry about how much it's gonna cost. For me, I had a few issues back to back with it, those smaller gremlins, and it did start to annoy me, but it didn't annoy me because of the price. It annoyed me just because it was kind of one thing after another. So be prepared for that, but don't necessarily let it get you down or put you off the car. If it happens, just deal with it and move on. And if it doesn't, of course, just enjoy the car. But as I've said before, of course, no car is perfect. Literally every car ever built is going to break down. It's just a matter of time. So don't be too surprised that a British engineered GT car can have some electrical gremlins. It's kind of part of the territory. Ultimately then, I hope that this video has shed some light on your choice between the 4.2 XK and the 4.2 XKR. I would say as a kind of a simplified nugget to end the video on, if you're looking for more affordable, because of course I haven't quoted any specific prices here because they fluctuate all the time, at least here in the UK, generally speaking that the XK is cheaper for obvious reasons. If you're looking for the lower price, the slightly better fuel economy, and maybe a little bit more of an understated and more, I would say elegant approach to its looks with the smoother body kit, uh, less overtly aggressive styling, and the more subtle rolling on way which it delivers its performance, then go for the lower model. If you want the car which can do technically pretty much everything that the lower model can do, plus the more aggressive looks, more of the wow factor, of course the updated engine with the supercharger and for sure more extreme performance, then of course go for the R. For me, I actually changed my stance before and after driving them. I used to prefer the XK because I liked the smoother, simpler look. But then when I actually drove both of them, I ended up liking the R more. So ultimately that is my biggest piece of advice. Drive them both and potentially try and get your hands on the five liter models as well. Because spoiler alert for that episode, my feelings on the five liter XK versus the five liter XKR are exactly the opposite to my feelings here. For this one, I prefer the R. For the 5 litre, I prefer the base model. And the reason why is because the base model of that one has 385 horsepower. So it already feels more than powerful enough. It's borderline R territory, and the elegance suits that car down to a T. But be sure to check out those other videos which I mentioned if you're looking for more info in terms of the XK ownership experience. And of course, stick around on the channel for more in future. But until next time, I'll see you then. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.